To Andrew Culp, Deleuze was not just the joyous thinker of connectivity, as is often claimed, where machinic assemblages undergo endless differentiation. To quote Culp, Dark Deleuze creates concepts only to write apocalyptic science fiction. It was Foucault who half-jokingly claimed this century would be deemed Deleuzean. Sure enough, today, traditionalist concerns of runaway technology and overconnectivity are abundant. This all isn't the work of some mad scientist, though. To Culp, technology has not exceeded our capacity to control it, and we are perfectly aware of what we are doing. Connectivity thus has the aim to connect everyone to one world, a part of a global hegemonic plan founded in accordance with the state and corporate sector. Connectivity has become a positively expressed form of propaganda used for purposes of propagating power. It is thus necessary to create, as Deleuze stated, vacuoles of non-communication that break these circuits so they are not extended. Like the death of God and the death of man, there is call for the death of the world. Deleuze alters Nietzsche's concept of destruction to include creation. In other words, destruction for the purposes of construction. Philosophy, as the art of creating concepts, thus must also include catastrophes of some destructive kind. Through atomism, where the relation of two terms produce an independent third term, which allows for a line of flight outside the place of its origin, supplying the world with materials for its own destruction, where something new has been created, is the ultimate intent. With human concerns comes a selfish anthropocentrism, but the way forward is to invite and not deny death. This is Deleuze's reworking of the death drive, which we discussed in relation to land's use of zero intensity and the empty body without organs, which to Deleuze is the imminent Spinozian substance. Similarly, the concept of us having no future, as discussed with Mark Fisher, can only occur when our present conditions that keep us in a no future state are killed. One must herald in a sense of hatred away from Deleuze's affirmation of joy and become like Rimbaud's violent barbarian. Hatred is the other half of love, and one cannot exist without the other. Culp highlights upon Fritz Lang's Metropolis to show where the techno-affirmationist dream of connectivity will lead to, where below the new Tower of Babel the working classes are enslaved to the very machine's automation sought to eliminate. Side note, uh, Lang's Metropolis should be uh, online for you to watch if you haven't already seen it. I might also recommend the 2001 anime by the same name, which was inspired partly by Lang's film and contains similar themes, uh, connecting man with the machine as well as the transhuman Superman, uh, which is to be created by the film's aristocratic class. So those are both good movies to check out. So to Culp, rather than examine Lang's Hegelian meditation, though, it's better to listen to Metropolis's Whore of Babylon, who wants to watch the world essentially go to hell, descending from lightness to darkness, or what he calls from the chapel and down into the crypt. So crypts and catacombs are areas of seclusion where persecuted Christians in Rome could actually pray when they were being persecuted. So crypts, despite the association with death, are underground or subterranean places of architectural power. Deep within these labyrinthian places and paths, one develops a cryptography, a conspiracy of contraries or opposites that complement each other and which come across as cryptic when conveyed by their very ambivalence. But to Deleuze, this does not produce identicality, but of course difference. We see dualisms in the form of smooth or striated spaces, the molar or the molecular, and the root of the rhizome, etc. As we brought up with atomism and the Deleuzean line of flight, the point again is to create a third term from the two. The third term arises from the outside in this sense, leading to the line of flight. We can note Deleuze's alchemic nature best, I suppose, in this sense, where two elements form a completely new compound. As I have said before, Deleuze is, to me, admired, of course, as one of the ultimate alchemists. Each contrary or opposite leads to a forking path, offering an alternate route between two ways, and the forking path, of course, inspired by the garden, 
uh, of Forking Pass by the great Jorge Borges, um, whom you should all read if, if you haven't already, but that's where it comes from. So Culp splits certain Deleuzian concepts into their opposite, the joyous or the dark path, advocating that we take the dark path so as to foster this sense of destruction which can lead to new creations, or the death which will lead to rebirth, like an alchemic phoenix, you know, arising out of its own ashes, or um, like, you know, in Sele, <laughs> in the end of Evangelion, right, where we, we gnostically say how the, the fate of destruction uh, can be the joy of rebirth. So we see with Dark to lose this, you know, kind of Gnostic and alchemical need to destroy our old world, and like Abraxas, you know, break out of our old shell, you know, which is symbolic of the old world, so as to be reborn, enlightened and illuminated between two opposing states of being as the quote-unquote the third, uh, which mirrors Deleuze's, uh, Deleuze's own model of the body without organs, which is the egg, right, of becoming alchemically other. So as, as we brought up before with Eric Vogelin, this is why we're kind of always engaged um, in a Gnostic war in this sense. You know, the world itself is a, is, is a Gnostic war. Um, but going back to Culp, so the task to Culp is thus to destroy the world and not create uh, concepts or conceptions that assist the world as it currently is. So this cryptic conspiracy will be known through the war machines, which remember are the lines of flight that allow us to become other. Um, thus, it's connected to the third term that comes from the outside. Now, as we mentioned, Deleuze calls for destruction, so new concepts can be created. But again, in our contemporary times where, you know, quote unquote, disruptive innovation is key to capitalism, and it's kind of the motto, you know, hailed by corporations today. So to cope, we must not create so as um, not to collude with capitalism itself. We must philosophize with a hammer in Nietzsche's sense, in, uh, in a call, what he says to Krishna, right, as, as the Oppenheimer, as Oppenheimer quotes, you know, to become death, uh, destroyer of worlds. So only through this disaster can we break free from the present state that we're in. Uh, as we discussed before in our Epimetheism videos, the present, past, and future, remember, are empty forms of time to Deleuze. Everything is omnipresent where the past and future are represented in the present, right? In other words, the past is history at present, and the future is the projecting or the projection of what is to come at present. So past and future are thus represented at present, uh, imminently expressed. Now, to culp, those who hate the world must short-circuit this present uh, or the here and now. So we have to short-circuit the present. Deleuze and Guattari advocate for the new earth, which is supposed to be a utopia, but of course dystopia is appearing more and more likely in our modern day age. So again, as we discussed, I'm just bringing up Sarah from Rose, right? So we see this, the new world developing alongside the quote unquote new man, uh, kind of driven by this Gnostic and nihilistic and alchemical Promethean push for, for progress. But to quote Culp, utopia becomes the map to transform the now here into the nowhere. Um, and that's kind of like the big theme of this book, taking the now here and turning it into nowhere, destroying it. So to Culp, destroying God is one thing, right? But to destroy the world is another, and that's extremely heretical. So it's a fierce pessimism, uh, pessimism I'm sorry, needed to shatter the cosmos. To Culp, the dark Deleuze essentially focuses on unbecoming, and not assemblages, since assemblages match our current capitalistic world that produces the subjective self in the same way it produces material products. We're trying to escape from that. The undoing of the subject is unbecoming itself. So when subjects cast uh, a line to the outside through this line of flight, identities don't survive. And so really becoming is a process of unbecoming in this sense. By becoming quote unquote undone, being and identity are uh, disestablished and disintegrated. If it's easier, we can think of it, again, in terms of alchemy and alchemical terms, focusing on, remember, disillusion or the black sun stage um, of the alchemic process, which is initially needed to engage in the act of transformation or transmutation, uh, which leads into Culp's next sec uh, section on existence, which, of course, calls for transformation instead of genesis or creation. So, 
In terms of the Kantian noumena and Kant's take on law from a transcendental perspective, uh, Culp uh, writes, expressing their disapproval, of course, of this, Deleuze and Guattari draw a portrait of Kant that depicts him as a vampiric death machine feeding off the world. And so if we think of, we think of land, uh, that vampiric death machine, I think it's a good image of, of Kant in that sense. But Kant makes the law essentially rational through his synthesis, right? Remember we talked the great synthesizer, which we, we discussed before. So Deleuze um, uses you know, the war machine as this nomadic force of transformation. Uh, avoiding to create a new order or image of the world. So there's no new genesis that, that's really needed. We're only focusing on the transformative act of becoming. So unlike uh, Lacan, right, the Lacanian real, which is of course impossible to reach as we discussed, Deleuze takes the Spinozian approach where within the real, everything is possible, right? Because it's this imminent perspective. Within the real, everything is possible. Lack is only because we are deprived of desire, right? We're not focusing on desire as lack because in the psychoanalytic sense, we're focusing on the schizoanalytic uh, sense of, of desiring machines in this sense. So uh, Quentin uh, Mielasu's claims in After Finitude um, states, you know, how we reach for the noumenon, right? That is always outside our grasp um, or perceptions or perceiving experiences. So the post-Kantian idea of correlationism, that you know humans can't exist without the world and vice versa, goes against the concept of things existing outside of sense perception. So the noumenon brings with it an end of man and the anthropocentric age, essentially, uh, existing on the outside. However, in anti-Oedipus, man or nature doesn't exist even. Right? The only thing that's important in anti-Oedipus is the production of production itself. So Deleuze and Guattari replace, remember, the theater of representation for the factory of production in this sense. So difference and repetition occur through a uh, disjunctive synthesis, which we discussed, right, making the third from the two, that produces, you know, these kind of disjointed and divergent differences. Uh, and those were meant to be used to kind of confuse, scramble, um, all these oppressive, right, codified uh, systems and forms of order and organization. In other words, you know, it deorganizes, right, deterritorializes. As we discussed with Hart and Negri, though, it rules over a virtual empire of difference in this sense. So capital thus becomes indistinguishable from the schizo subject, where Marx's, you know, class war has been drowned out in a sea of this difference. So thus, like with empire, the task again rests in the destruction of the world, in this world, and advancing towards nothing. Now, Heidegger's nothing, Darida's sense of difference, Leotard's uh, different, uh, Athuzer's invisible, Hannah Arendt's pariah, Deleuze and Guattari's nomad, Homi K. Baba's hybrid, uh, Agamemnon's refugee, Edward Said's emigre, etc. So it brings up all these terms, but all of these uh, terms uh, denote conflicts of difference, which result in mapping lines of flight to the outside. Uh, the problem with complexity and multiplicity is, you know, like how Derrida's deconstruction defers meaning, right, from multiple meta narratives. It, it pushes it uh, down the road, it defers it. Complexity also colludes with capitalism in terms of deferring time, which, quote, you know, it delays the arrival of this revolution, whether that's a proletariat revolution, uh, like Culp claims or otherwise, but it delays the revolution through deferment. So asymmetry is the term, of course, used to express these differences, which are not identical or equal. Thus, it, this is the, really, uh, to Deleuze, this is the calculating God, right, where, whose numbers fail to ever add up. Um, it, all is basically irreducible inequality. Um, you know, Land would later adhere to the thermodynamic model of entropy and use this uh, in his mechanism, but of course Deleuze warned against that. Um, and applying this uh, to the world, this is a big, this is the big difference between land and, and, and Deleuze, right? Land is pure deterritorialization, uh, destroying of all strata, uh, and Deleuze, of course, uh, warns warns against that. So, anyways, um, if all is asymmetrical, and remember asymmetrical, right? The third term created from the two, leading to a line of nomadic flight, then all draws on power from the outside. 
So asymmetry takes on guerrilla tactics, uh, later use, of course, land in terms of K tactics. But again, one must be cautious that such complexity does not defer the guerrilla tactics itself, which is currently happening in our society. It's being deferred. So in short, complexity, you know, it, he warns uh, that it can mobilize, but it can also impair forces. Uh, it's kind of the snake oil promoted to solve all our problems, you know, uh, and alchemy again, like the philosopher's stone is supposed to be this panacea or remedy or cure to all diseases, but it really just doesn't seem to have any real medicinal value. Um, all it did, to quote Culp, all it did was make everyone a unique and special snowflake in our society, and we certainly see this, where we see these, you know, the special snowflakes everywhere, and we, you know, and that's all it's really done, so... Global capitalism basically uh, caught on to this. You know, it, it noticed it. It noticed what uh, you know we're trying to do with complexity, and so it uses complexity now for its own power-based purposes. And so, you know, again comes the call to to, to summon Shiva, as it were. Now, in my own opinion, and as we talked about with Alul, in line with Alul, complexity. Remember, it's just a technique which has been incorporated into the system for it to function more efficiently. And we're seeing that here with this, with rhizomatic models and complexity. Same was true with the with internet, um, the '90s internet optimism that people saw it would liberate us, it would free us, but it just got incorporated into the system um, for a sake of efficiency. So, the more it seems we try to, you know, kind of wield weapons against the social world, those weapons get turned on us, right? So we mean well, but we we basically get burned in this, you know. And as they say, the path to hell is paved with good intentions. Uh, as the saying goes, so now to Culp, uh, Culp goes on a, uh, he tries to provide some alternatives. So to Culp, uh, we're, we're talking about infinity is tied to the hierarchical order, specifically of that of God, which we've talked about. And so he wants to collapse that hierarchical order into something more horizontal, representing finitude, um, which is better at warding off centralized forms of, of power, or essentially where the eternal collapses into the finitude of existence is how he words it. So he also advocates for cruelty over intensity. Uh, intensity corresponds to individuation and difference. So obviously, uh, Artaud's, theor uh, Artaud, uh, Artaud's theater of cruelty to Culp in, uh, empowers us in the sense of implanting images in the brain that we can't really comprehend. So it stands as a figure of nothingness, which essentially unlinks us from ourselves in this sense. So instead of rhizomatic organization, Culp calls for unfolding as an alternative. So the rhizome, right, like we talked about with the internet, it can't, it can't save us anymore. So instead, to Culp, we should focus on the lines found in folds to escape to the outside, where all is essentially enveloped within itself. Uh, where folds reduce and oppositely unfolding grows and expands, you know, all of which occurs in a body uh, similar. He brings up Leotard's great ephemeral skin, uh, remember from his book Libidinal Economy. It's right in the first chapter, so if you just you can go online, just look up Libidinal Economy and read the first page. Um, and the whole point is that it's focusing on you know what drives our desires essentially. So to cope, what fuels capitalism? is the massive energy generated through the unfolding of such bodies that focus on conduction, of course, instead of communication in Leotard's sense. So unfolding such as this is to be pushed, of course, to the limit, reaching the terror of death and the empty void. In terms of ethics, Culp claims democracy should be abolished, uh, opposing, of course, Hart and Negri, who are trying to use this Deleuzian model to prove you know, produce democracy um, in the multi in the work their multitude, as well as empire. So Deleuze and Guattari uh, were of course critical of democracy, calling it the cousin of totalitarianism, uh, having no place for it in their utopian new earth of new men. Um, as we discussed in prior videos, remember democracy must always rely upon the sovereign state of exception when threatened by an emergency. So to Culp, Dark Deleuze, you know, is a mad black uh, communism that destroys the factory of production, attacking, remember again, the creation of concepts which are reproducing our current reality in which assist capitalism itself. So remember, we're, we're reducing the now here into the nowhere. So it's a guerrilla tactic to wage a war of annihilation against God, man, and the world which is seen solely through this, you know, this joyful 
Deleuzian perspective. So we're trying to abolish that, annihilate that, and eliminate that. So I think that's a good place to end for now. Uh, we'll pick up part two, um, where cult basically shits all over Nick Land and accelerationism. <laughs> so we'll save that for the second video. Uh, shout out to the user Unplace, um, who had brought up, uh, if I was familiar with, asked if I was familiar with Dark to Lose. And so I just decided to make a video on it. It's a text I read a, a while back, but... I figured I'd just re-skim, you know, over the major points again, and it's never bad to brush up on a book. So until next time, guys, uh, see you in part two. Later.